technical interlude demonstrating my age and uh, fumbling technical nature, but what the heck. Um, I'm glad to be here tonight working with my friends Kevin and Brendan and all of you wonderful uh, forest landowners and fans to listen to uh, this presentation about wildlife in a general sense in the forest of Washington. And this is intended as the first of a series of four that are part of this uh, pioneering webinar series through WS Forestry Extension. And uh, we came up with a clever title, Lions and Squirrels and Bears, oh my, as a reference to the iconic film, obviously The Wizard of Oz and the book and all of the, the culture surrounding that, you know, and the, the journey, the magical stuff. And so let's go on an adventure and, and find our own set of interesting companions. So those of you who haven't met, that's kind of what I look like. Um, and I, I come with me. I'll show you some pictures and we'll tell a few stories. Working with the amazing WSU staff, that's Kevin with one of his favorite pets. And he and Brendan share the role tonight of being behind the curtain, uh, like the great and powerful Oz. And so I wanted to make the implication that Brendan and Kevin are both great and powerful uh, because they sort of are in their own wonderful educational sense. So off we go. And I, I, I always like to start a presentation by telling you uh, what it is we're going to talk about. And so this is just a rough outline of where we're going to get here because we won't answer every question. We'll lead, hopefully lead you to some ideas that will help you get a better grasp of the wildlife that you enjoy and look at in the forest lands of Washington. And so I'm coming at it less from a zoological perspective than from an ecological perspective. And so, you know, we'll look at a little ecology, we'll look at a little forest, we'll talk about niches, uh, and we'll go to some certain animals in and out as we go. And then the last thing would be a teaser about what you can do and how uh, we can get you to keep going with us in this series. So you are here. We'll start back in the big picture. I'd like to remind people that we never actually saw the Earth from space until 1968 when the astronauts finally got far enough away to get a full view of it. And that was a really profound moment in human uh, realization of ecology, habitats, etc. So you are here and we are on the western edge of the North American continent in a particularly, I think, although everywhere is interesting, but this is a very rich ecologically happening part of the world where we are. And a little bit of a, a overview in history geological history in particular, that the earth, you know, if you ever study this, the atmosphere is not very dense. It's just a couple of miles wide. And then the surface of our beautiful planet is covered with life. I mean, like the life as a phenomenon is almost entirely close to and just under the surface. They have found some bacteria way down in mine shafts and the, the uh, geothermals in the ocean bottom. But most of it, by way, most of it is right on the surface. And there also happen to be seven and a half billion human beings who are increasing in their uh, influence, let's just say, on the surface of the earth. And today, I can't remember the number, but something like 40% or maybe more of the surface of the earth is devoted to servicing humankind in the form of cropland, cities, etc. And this era has gotten a name, uh, the Anthropocene. Maybe some of you have heard this, but this is where the very functioning and service of the earth is being so influenced by the presence of man that things are happening at a big scale. And we're losing biodiversity at a really fast rate. The sixth extinction crisis is now. The other five were like at the end of the, let's see, end of the uh, uh, Mesozoic, for example, when the asteroid hit and the dinosaurs died. Um, there's been a whole series that were a long time ago. Well, the sixth one is right now. And this is a big deal. That's an ivory-billed woodpecker. That's the one that went extinct early in the 20th century, an actual taxidermy of an ivory-billed woodpecker from the Field Museum in Chicago and, you know, a dinosaur. And that is the famous Tyrannosaurus Sue. You might have heard of her. 
and uh, chasing me, obviously, in a nod to Jurassic Park. So it's kind of a bummer. You know, if you're a fan of nature and you start thinking about this stuff, it's like, oh, man, and I'm, I'm sure many of us have had these, like, sinking feelings. Like, and then you rally and go, okay, what can we do? Well, part of what I love about working with small landowners is, well, what we can do is manage our little piece of the world to maintain habitat biodiversity, uh, a place for some of these creatures to continue to live. And we do good work. It's, it's really cool. So this is where we're going to go tonight. So about two thirds of Washington is naturally forested. And this is a crude approximation of where that is. But, you know, the center of the state is naturally a dry uh, shrub step or step habitat but we have all the way from over here in the far west you know the the uh, rainforest of the olympic peninsula the puget sound trough the island complex the cascades uh down here up in northeast where um there's kind of a rocky mountain forest and then the blue mountains down here which is a whole nother thing but about two-thirds of the state is naturally forested just to, i need to point this out that there's about four uh, 22 million acres of forest land, and this map shows ownership, and about four and a half million of it are owned by small landowners, people like me and you, and uh, there's a lot of landowners in our group here tonight, um, and there's about 215,000, and this is, by the way, 2007 numbers, so I think that number is higher now. Um, we're going to find out. We're actually redoing this study right now. And the small forest lands tend to be in certain areas of the state, like in Lewis County, down here in Clark County. And I'm just pointing at that dark green color is a private, small private forest land. That's people with, you know, five to 500 acres, usually 500. We, every now and then there's some, a few thousand. Lots up here in Northeastern Washington. This is a lot of land. And in order to help people with their land management, we have a program. And this is the DNR's Forest Stewardship Program. We work really closely with Washington State University Forestry Extension. And what we do is we help people write forest management plans. We help them with cost share grants, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a website, you can find us. But you know, if you wondered how in the world are people gonna know how to manage their forest land, it's like, well, that's what we do. And I'm the wildlife biologist in this program with Matt Preventure. Some of you met, that's Scott Chambers from over in Ellensburg. So anyway, that's what we do. Uh, we and WSU are here to help you. Really, we are. Okay, on with the show topic. So what is this wildlife thing? Well, you know, this is getting a little scientific -y here. Free ranging animals supported in voluntary, I call it unrestrained way, you know, they, they live on their own, but they're not always completely free of human influence. So this is a, just an example up in the Skagit. In the wintertime, the swans and the snow geese and lots of other waterfowl come in by the uh, maybe hundreds of thousands and feed on agricultural uh, residue. Um, so those are definitely wild animals taking advantage of human activity. Now, this is an interesting wrinkle. This is a red-tailed hawk that was cap that was, see, might have been captured. You know, I'm not sure if that animal was captured, but it's a falconer's bird that now is reliant entirely on the falconer for behavior. Is that wildlife? Mm, I don't think so. And how about Boyd Norton's dog? Is that wildlife? That's Tucker, I would say. That descendant of wolf is no longer wildlife. So anyway, wildlife lives on its own. And, you know, something about wildlife that I just, I just love is that everybody likes it. Everybody's got their own wildlife story. You start talking to people and they find out, you know, they find out I'm a wildlife biologist and they'll want to tell me something about something that they saw which is totally wonderful because that means every single one of us is a data gatherer. Every single one of us is peeking somewhere into the life of a wild animal and getting our own little tidbit. And often those stories are about deer, bears, uh, eagles, cougars. If you're lucky, a wolf, you know, even if it's an anecdote, the big charismatic megafauna. But you know what? Those guys are only part of the story. We've got about 400 species of wildlife uh, in Washington's forests, and I'll define them here in a minute, that uh, most of which 
are small. Most of them are subtle and hidden, I like to say. Things like mice, small mammals under the logs. A salamander, oh, that's right, I can use the, the pointer. Salamanders living down in the duff, occasionally coming up. Songbirds down in the duff. Snakes under, under rock piles. Uh, screech owl hiding in a cavity. Uh, you know, things that you don't see. Most of those animals are mostly invisible, which makes them even more interesting. Oh, and what about uh, slugs and insects? Well, you know, some people actually do classify these as wildlife, and I'm using the, uh, what's the word, focus definition of vertebrates for tonight. But indeed, these animals uh, will benefit from the same habitats as the larger animals. And so sometimes wildlife biologists will like focus on a certain species of butterfly for a conservation plan or something. So um, they're, they are definitely wild animals. And some would argue, and I might actually agree with them, that they indeed are wildlife too. So, but you know, that's, that's, that's academic. Excuse me for a moment. Hey, got that frog. There we go. Okay, so how many of us, raise your hand, you don't have to say anything in the box, uh, if you took a biology class in uh, high school or middle school? Okay, we're all raising our hands. Good. Yep. I see. <laughs> look at that. Kevin, look, they're raising their hands. I like it. Mm -hmm. Most of us did, yes. Or in college. And somewhere in there, you saw some diagram like this, you know, something about food webs, food pyramids. And this essentially lays out the basic ecology that all life, almost all life, uh, is derived from photosynthesis, that plants of some kind, you know, literally building their bodies out of air and water through the miracle of photosynthesis, then something else eats them, then something else eats them, then something else eats them, and then they die, and then something breaks it down into the soil, and then it grows back into a plant. It's a totally cool thing. And if you start drawing lines between, you know, the, the, uh, the Douglas fir cone and the Douglas squirrel, now you're over here doing a food web. Oh, and then the coyote catches the squirrel and, and the coyote catches the snake, but the snake, ate, you know, you get it. That's a food web and this is a pyramid. And it just sort of demonstrates the interconnectedness of wildlife. And when we do wildlife observation, we're usually just plucking an individual somewhere off of this complex world and making observations. So wildlife biology. Um, all wildlife needs four things. Oh, Kevin, did you tell them there's gonna be a test? Oh, are you, okay, if you don't pass the test with 80% or better, you're uh, trapped in this Zoom room uh, for 24 hours, right? I'm kidding, that's a joke. Um, there is no test, I just wanted to scare you. So these four things are needed. This is in your Wildlife 101 class, food, water, cover, space. So all animals have to eat something. And you know, for example, a songbird uh, eating fruiting uh, huckleberries or uh, choke cherries off of a plant. All animals need water. They don't necessarily have to get free water, though they will use it when it's available, but many animals get the moisture they need from their food. Um, but most animals like to get a drink. Sooner or later, they like to get a drink. They gotta have a place to hide. They have to have a high place to hide, either for resting, uh, predator avoidance, or uh, for raising their young. You know, you think about animals when, they're, when they have babies, whatever their version of babies is, they're really vulnerable and they need a place to hide. Or uh, an interesting one right here, this hollow log in a tree plantation, Douglas Squirrel had used it to hide its uh, cones. Its midden was inside of this log. So this was an important piece of cover for a squirrel. And they also need a place to live. They've got to have enough room to do their home range territory thing. And so home range would be the, the, the area that an animal moves in to get its food, water, and its cover. Its territory, they're not really exactly interchangeable because a territory implies it's defended usually for the purposes of reproduction and breeding, but not always. Sometimes there's other types of territories, but you've got to have enough room for the animal to do that. And so this is a hypothetical large territory in a mountain valley. And imagine a cougar that lives in this valley and has a home range of, you know, two miles by five miles during the summer. Or you may have a Douglas squirrel. And I'm referring, I, I really like Douglas squirrels. You're going to pick this up tonight because they are our native 
conifer squirrel, they eat cones, and they occur in most forest types. And so they've been studying and they found out that our their home range is somewhere between like three and 10 acres. It can be one hillside and that squirrel and its uh, relatives have lived there their whole lives. And let's just say a shrew or a little mouse may live just right here in three square meters of space on a hill. So it's all relative. It's kind of a question of scale. And usually our small parcels, you know, our 20 acres, our 10 acres are like just a little piece of this uh, mystery going on on the landscape. So for an animal to succeed, and I mean succeed by way of not only surviving, but reproducing, all of those things have to be present all of the time. You know, and if and we'll get to that, if something goes away, they can't survive. So I like beavers because beavers must have water. Obviously, they're an aquatic mammal. And they, by the way, they can't poop if they're not in the water. And so they got to have all that stuff where they are. I like this picture because this group of elk on a private landowner way over in Pacific County uh, said these elk don't really go anywhere. He could see them all the time. I can see why. Here was this wet meadow. They're eating these wet grasses. There's water right there and he said they would go bed down on this hill during the day and then come back and just hang out and nobody was bothering them so it was all right there so these animals were able to have a relatively small home range because they didn't have to go very far to get their needs okay so here we go so if you ever took uh, wildlife biology you saw this and any population, oh, and by the way, I always put this graph in here so that the WSU guys think I'm actually kind of a scientist rather than just a storyteller, uh, you know, galvant. Um, so anyway, so this is a conceptual gra a graph that uh, shows what happens with generalized populations of anything. And so this is sort of an imaginary founder effect where a population, we, by the way, a population is a interacting group of organisms of the same species that are able to breed and uh, essentially maintain themselves as a unit, whether or not it persists over time. So a population is a functional unit of, uh, of ecology and wildlife biology. Okay, so the, the population will generally rise to some point and then vacillate, go, not, is that the right word? Vacillate, uh, alternate, uh, oscillate over some imaginary threshold. And sometimes they go way up and sometimes they go way down. And there's been studies, the classic was the snowshoe hare and the lynx, but it's pretty consistent. And what the, uh, the modeling and the scientist guys figure out is, well, there's a limiting factor. There's something that keeps the population from, you know, always going up. And they could be biotic, meaning it could be predators, it could be food, or it could be abiotic. It could be like non-living. That's what abiotic is, uh, like drought or um, yeah, drought's a classic one where the population would drop. So this is important because these limiting factors are part of those four things usually, not always entirely, but food, water, cover, territory. So there you go, okay. Um, so for example, let's look at limiting factors for Douglas squirrel. Um, you know, the Douglas squirrel being this little cone eater guy. And oh, can you see the squirrel? I'm, I'm gonna help you out here. He's right there, food, water, cover. So this squirrel is able to utilize cover on this big Douglas fir tree because it's wide enough and he looks kind of like a branch anyway that a hawk uh, might not see him because he looks like a branch. So he's able to use that for cover and he's able to get enough food from the branches of these mature trees to be able to exist on that landscape. So what limits Douglas squirrels? It's, uh, it's uh, mature trees with cones and cavities i.e. holes in dead trees or big enough branches where they could build a nest. They actually will build a nest. So here's an example, a young uh, Douglas fir plantation with young alder. There's no Douglas squirrels there because there's not really very many cones. Uh, there's no cavity trees uh, and they're just not there for a while. This forest had Douglas firs on Whidbey Island, south end of Whidbey, and uh, this guy had Douglas squirrels chirping all around because you can look at it, there were nice canopies. So anyway, and here's a tree full of cavities. Um, I throw great blue herons in here because 
they're not so much a forest species, but they do nest in trees near water. So you could argue they're a forest species and they, they're colonial. And I bet most of us have seen a heron rookery with these big stick nests. And over the years, there would be places where these big long lived birds would come back year after year and have successful breeding, et cetera. And in the last few years, as the bald eagle has become common on the landscape again. And don't forget that bald eagles were headed for extinction in the 60s and 70s because of DDT. And they're a huge success story of the Endangered Species Act because we outlawed that limiting factor of this chemical. But now there's places where these bald eagles have started preying on the great blue herons and have actually uh, forced some abandonment of nest sites. So a predator could be a limiting factor. It can get really complicated from <laughs> all these different different angles. How about black-tailed deer? I bet most people uh, on our group here have black-tailed deer uh, on their place or somewhere nearby. And uh, that's kind of an interesting thing because black-tailed deer, what do they need? They need shrubs, food, water, and places to hide. Their home ranges aren't that big, say, 40 acres to 200 acres. They're non-migratory, say like on Whidbey sort of thing. They eat the shrub layer, lots of food. So what limits black-tailed deer? Well, frankly, it depends where you are. Um, you know, and I, I like to point out, uh, say in the edge of the Cascades where there's uh, cougars and bears that would prey on them, that's different than say Orcas Island where there's no predators. We'd be the coyotes get a few, cars get a few. It's a really interesting dynamic there. How about a pileated woodpecker? Everybody knows what a pileated is, I'm sure. Um, that these animals eat insects out of rotten wood. And so they will chisel into trees to get at uh, wood borers and other insects. They'll eat carpenter ants. And they must have uh, adequate wood in their territory and they'll cross open ground. These things will move big distances on the landscape, which is pretty interesting. They did a study down in the Blue Mountains, radio tagging pileateds and found out their home ranges in the Blue Mountains were somewhere between 5,000 and like 12 to 15,000 acres, which is essentially connecting all the dots of where they flew, which is pretty darn big. But within those movement things, they had to have this. They had to have adequate numbers of big enough trees to put a nest in like this one. Don't they look, don't they look like dinosaurs? Kevin, do they look like dinosaurs? Yes, they do. And places to feed. So they got to have those within reach. So I think that, that I hope hopefully that makes sense that the, the limiting factors of food, water, and cover have to be available for the particular life history need of the particular species. Okay. So there we go, foundational. So in Washington, now we're gonna talk about the habitats. Um, there's kind of a, a crude dividing line right down the Cascades Crest. And on the west side, you know, we have the, the wetter forest and over here we have the drier forest. And I'm gonna speak, I'll say a few things about those now that the Eastern Washington forest tend to be a little more open, the trees farther apart, the uh, shrub layer less well developed, but it's still a multi layered conifer dominated environment. Western Washington, uh, with different species, you know, instead of uh, ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, you might have western red cedar, hemlock, Douglas fir again. In this still layered, it's still a layered conifer setting, but a much, much richer shrub layer. And part of the year, as the West Siders well know, it's drippy and cool and really, really amazing. So important biotic point that Washington was once covered, not that long ago, I like to call it a mighty forest. So that two thirds of the state had varying degrees of old forest. I mean, you know, frankly, there were fires periodically and such, but the state was mostly covered the two thirds of was forest with some kind of a amazing old multi-layered, look at the way this canopy is, gappy canopy, shrubs in the understory, down logs, et cetera, et cetera. And in many places, really big trees. This tree in the Quinault rainforest over there by Lake Quinault is like five feet across, 200 feet high, probably uh, at least 400 years old. Just incredible, uh, just rich 
deep forest um, on the east side. And, and I like to point out superficially, yeah, it's a lot different, but it's kind of the same in that it's a multi-layered pine forest with big conifer stems. And there was a full complement of native species. And interesting to me that some of them were consistent all the way from, you know, the conifer forest of Northeast Washington, the Blue Mountains, all the way out to the coast, similar to Douglas fir. Douglas fir occurs all the way through there. Douglas squirrels, flying squirrels. And these are just some of the examples of the uh, full complement that existed. Well, this happened. So when civilization, I'm gonna use the term loosely, showed up in the late 1800s, and we started to harvest Washington, and uh, Dave Peterson, I like the way he put this, he said, you know, you have to remember that in Washington, virtually all of the lower elevation lands that are now in private hands was cut. It, it was heavily logged in a really short period of time from like late 1800s to 1925, something like that, you know, and I bet many of us in the group here have some kind of a connection to the old time stories of grandpa and the crosscut saws and this remarkably hard work of, of cutting this forest and uh, harvesting these trees to build the great cities of the West, San Francisco, Seattle, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this is, you know, it happened pretty quickly. The landscape was transformed from that vast forest, mostly forest, and the forest had gaps in it, into this. This picture down here in the lower left was a, a grandmother's picture of a, one of our, our coach planning clients from Chehalis. This is the, one of the forks of the Chehalis River, and I think it was 1903. And so it, by 1903, look at that barn they had built, this tidy little farmhouse, and I love to point this out. Look on the hill. Look, the forest is gone and the logs are no longer in the river. This river has been used for log jams. It's turned into farmland by 1903. So a lot of evidence of this essentially homestead era is still around us. And now, you know, we, we've got this current phenomenon of some, uh, oh, what do you call it? Uh, suburbanization, uh, homes in the woods, et cetera, et cetera. Still quite a bit of rural lands with what I'll loosely call woodlots scattered around. And so the state has seen a pretty significant transformation. Anybody ever seen that thing? That's uh, near Arlington. And I'm just amazed that they managed to grow a Volkswagen bus and a maple tree. I don't know how they did that. Anyway, so there you go. Um, yeah, so the evidence of this historic forest still exists here. I just find this so interesting. If you have property that has old stumps, go out and just look at them and try to visualize the stand that was there, you know, not shoot, just over 100 years ago. Well, since then, the forest has grown back in many places. This, and many of the forests that are on the small forest landowners look something like this. This is over uh, near Miller, that's actually Miller, Sylvania Park. That's a regrown natural forest that is telling us what happened there. Um, lots of these forests, there's the old stump, came back in a mixed uh, mixed forest of some conifers, uh, some hardwoods, like here's hardwoods, broadleaves, I should say. Here's a big leaf maple clump that obviously grew back from a harvested big leaf maple right next to some cedar trees tucked in here. Uh, cottonwoods round and about. Alder stands, alder stands, almost all of them are naturally regenerated from a harvest and then they seed it in. It's pretty amazing. Um, plantation forestry is really didn't get going until the mid 20th century uh, with the advent of nurseries and even age harvest and site preparation and all of these things. So a planted forest is one version of our forest that we have on the landscape right now. In Eastern Washington, uh, the big trees were cut out years ago and they were allowed to seed back in. Sometimes they would leave scattered seed trees and today, uh, partly thanks to Smokey the Bear, and that's a whole nother big story, we have a lot of dense stands like this one on the right and many stands like this on the left where there's scattered Douglas fir, ponderosa pine and such in these uh, open stands. So the current forest conditions are shaped by a lot of it is that old harvest history and how it grew back. And it's different from those historic conditions because there's more young forest, there's more openings, uh, human generated things like pastures and cities and roads and everything. But fundamentally, 
it's still there. It's really interesting because much of the biota is persisting on the landscape because it was previously adapted to disturbance in variable conditions. So, okay, so man, I am gonna run out of time, Kevin. This is terrible, I'm having such fun. Um, Kevin, is there, are there any burning questions so far? This was the point where we uh, asked if somebody had something to clarify, because I'm about to go in a section where we speak about uh, habitats and individual species, which is where sometimes people have their questions come out. Well, I think I, uh... I think I got most of the questions. I addressed, <laughs> I addressed the one that you could probably elaborate on, Ken. Uh, oh, you're back, Kevin. Good. Yep. Uh, Kevin apparently was dealing with his own wildlife problem. Uh, but uh, someone asked about do whether Douglas squirrels exclude uh, yeah. or are excluded by the eastern gray squirrel. You know, we talked about that earlier, but I, my, myself, I don't think so because the eastern gray squirrels are adapted to hardwood masts. So you think about where they're from, you know, back east, there's those uh, broadleaf forests of oaks and hickories and many, many species where they often have a continuous supply of some kind of mast, which is their main food, but they can eat other stuff. And you bring them out here and the urban canopy, and we, we tend to plant a lot of those trees from back east. And I actually think we've created kind of an artificial hardwood forest that benefits eastern gray squirrels. Case in point, the University of Washington campus, there's eastern gray squirrels and fox squirrels. And I don't believe there's any Douglas squirrels because Douglas squirrels are a conifer squirrel. They eat, they eat cones, they eat mushrooms. They're, they live in the conifer forest. And where they overlap, I think it's actually kind of a niche collision uh, more than a competition. And I, we, I had one opportunity to meet a fellow on Whidbey Island, Brendan, and he had feeders out with Douglas squirrels and Eastern gray squirrels side by side. And I said, do they compete? He said, yeah, and the little guys always win, which I thought was interesting. So there you go. Yep, okay, well, I'm gonna go right on then. Uh, oh, we had a car, okay, good. Okay, nice, excellent. All right, I'm gonna keep going here if we may. So a forest, people like to think of it as being a monolithic habitat type, but it's not. It's a complex habitat full of different niches. And the niche, uh, if, if you're not uh, familiar with that, is essentially a, let's call it a microhabitat. It's a, it's a derivative of habitat in general. So I like to lump, admittedly. So like in the forest canopy, I mean, excuse me, in the forest, the canopy, the leafy green trees could be a niche. The stems of the trees are a niche. The understory or the shrub layer or the brush is the derogatory term, is a whole different ball of wax than up there. And then the down logs and under the soil itself. This is a whole nother niche. So a few examples of species that might use these niches. Up in the, the canopy, say, of an alder stand, you could have golden crowned kinglets, and the birders in the group will know these little guys and see the little quivery, quick-moving birds that go, and they're gleaning tiny insects off of the bottoms of these leaves. Or back to my Douglas squirrel here, you might have a Douglas squirrel in the canopy gathering a cones that he caches, and then he goes over to the stem to hide in a cavity in a dead tree. The shrub layer or the brush. Um, this is pretty interesting because if, when we do a field trip sometime, we'll try this. If you stand in a given forest stand and count your overstory trees, you'll get, you know, hemlock, dug fir, cedar, alder, and you start counting the understory, and you will consistently get two to three times more dominant species, uh, Oregon grape, uh, red elderberry, salmonberry, huckleberry, uh, salal, uh, on and on and on. And so these, this understory layer has a lot of wildlife value, particularly in the woody plants like red elderberry. Here's a robin eating one of them. And you know, where do the charismatic megafauna live? They tend to live in the understory eating, uh, eating shrubs like deer or the stems themselves. So the tree, the wood of a tree, and I'm gonna elaborate on this quite a bit, uh, gosh, in a short few days uh, the, about dead wood. But you know, you might have the surface of a Douglas fir tree where a brown creeper goes up and hunts spiders in the cracks of the tree or a sap sucker that goes on the stem of the tree and wounds the tree to get at the oozing sap 
from the systematic wounding. And maybe you have a dead tree that gets a cavity in it, like this one, cavity made by a flicker that the tree swallow could nest in. And so stay tuned on that. And for those who don't uh, know me, I am obsessed with dead trees. They're, they are just so bloody interesting. And then they fall over and they decay. And, you know, down on the forest floor, they could provide a place for a salamander to, to hide or a, a small mammal to run along the base of it and live underneath of it, rotting down into the soil. Try this. If you haven't ever done this, pull apart some rotting wood and just dig around and watch for what you find. You'll find worms and insects and teeny tiny springtails. And if you're lucky, you'll blunder into a salamander down there in that wet stuff or, or slugs, racing slugs. So yeah. So back to this, that the 400 species are mostly an intact native fauna that's getting by on the landscape in invariable uh, population levels, you know, based on uh, many things, including the intensity of human impact. But most of the species that are here are from here, which is pretty amazing because other parts of the world, the biota has been significantly uh, diminished. Um, I, I will say some more about sapsuckers here in a minute, Emily. Thank you. Intact in this context would be um, the popu excuse me, the species complex that existed before civilization is still here. Yeah, I'm sorry, I mean, that is a little bit of a, intact being it's still here, right? It hasn't been totally diminished. Um, we've got a few newcomers, uh, starlings, possums, turkeys, barred owls, but you know, they've all kind of fit in and have found some semblance of a niche. Possums are a particularly interesting topic because many rural landowners see them at some point. And they were introduced in the 1920s as a fur-bearing animal, and turkeys were introduced as a game animal in the 1950s uh, in eastern Washington. But most of our animals are native, and this is just a... a, 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 a uh, tally of these these groups. So reptiles and amphibians have the lowest numbers of species, which makes some sense only because we're at a, a mid-latitude, uh, you know, cooler climate. Mammals, quite a few more, uh, you know, things like coyotes, shrews, elk, and birds, quite a few birds. Um, I bet you there's some birders in the group. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but quite a few birders often will be forest landowners. And we have about 500 so oh, there you go, seven, eight birders. Yes, nice, six, sweet, good work, good work, birders. Um, and insects, you know, being the highest number of species. But we have a pretty interesting biotic component in this state. Okay, so let's go to forestry and a few species here. Um, you know, forest succession is a concept that most of us understand that a forest will move from, oh, young trees, early cereal, to late cereal or mature in almost a predictable manner. And uh, sometimes people say, like, well, what is, is forestry good for wildlife? It's like, well, it depends. And so in this context, um, let's just look at a few of the species that would be associated with these different habitat conditions. So the early cereal stuff, that is the shrubs and the grasses, there's lots of birds out there. Um, and the birders, like my wife here, um, they, you often see them looking into bushes, trying to see things like the tohi and the white crown sparrows and the song sparrows. And so they will use this habitat extensively. Um, they even like uh, Himalayan blackberries because it provides shrub habitat, even though it does take over. Um, in grassy areas, you might have voles. Um, they call them meadow mouse, but these are the little short tailed guys that look kind of like guinea pigs. Their ears are really small. There's about eight species. Most of them live in grassy areas. They make those tunnels that show up on the surface when the snow melts. Um, yeah, so voles. Uh, this is just an example. Garter snakes. Garter snakes like open, grassy, brushy areas with a little bit of water. Sometimes they'll go out in the water and actually catch tadpoles and things like that. So that's a species of open, wet habitats. 
Um, deer. I always like to say a few things about deer because they, they come to people's mind. And tidbit that black-tailed deer and mule deer are actually the same species. The black-tail is a subspecies, a little bit darker, uh, different color tail, still has the big ears, and they can interbreed. They actually interbreed in the Cascades sometimes where the two groups uh, overlap. Um, let's see, antlers are fork. The mule deer migrate. Uh, the black tails tend to stick around. I'm say like on Whidbey Island, those deer don't migrate. They they localize. The bucks will move around. And kind of interesting, I saw someone from, from Anacortes. There are people in this uh, session right now who are thinking, yeah, I got deer in my town, a little town of Winthrop where I live. We got, and Twist, we got mule deer that stand around in town. Um, Anacortes has this amazing population of, of uh black tails that just kind of walk across the street. So there you go. In Eastern Washington, we have white tailed deer, which are uh, different. They don't interbreed, which is pretty, or very seldom do they interbreed. Their, their habits are relatively different. They're uh, not way closely related. These guys tend to be squirrely, like skittish, but even they can become conditioned to people and stand around in town like they do in Colville. And so the white-tailed deer and the black-tailed deer are two different species and they look different. Well, when the white-tailed deer has a white under its tail and when they run, they throw the thing up and laugh at you. <laughs> Jane's telling me, no kidding about uh, Anacortes. And here we've got a comment from Colville that they walk across the crosswalks, I believe it. And those are white tails in Colville. Yep. Um, so here, a little digression here, but you know, remember Gary Larson, he's so funny, um, you know, issues on hunting. Well, hunting used to be one of the dominant factors in wildlife management. And the society is changing a lot. People are more interested in observing wildlife, living with wildlife. And there are some of us, myself included, who'll still go out and, you know, try to harvest animals. But look at this graph. This is from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is uh, the number of the, I like this, the percentage of the population as hunters. So 1960, it was almost 8% almost of the population. In 2015, it was down to five. And that's, that's quite a trend. And this trend is continuing. If you go out and uh, ride around in the mountains during hunting season, it's a bunch of old guys in camps. And so this is an interesting thing, and it just reflects uh, societal values. Let's see. So we'll go back to some of the feature species here because, Kevin, I am going to be tight here, baby. Um, the hairy woodpecker, I like to refer to them as like every man's woodpecker. They occur in most forest types, about the size of a robin, white spot on its back, and they look a lot like the downy woodpecker. So this is a downy which is more common in areas dominated by uh, broadleafs. And here is a hairy side by side. And the downy has a little teeny beak. The hairy has kind of a big beak. They both drum, they both call, um, and they're largely non-migratory. And they got to have a tree big enough, to, big enough and rotten enough to make the hole in to build their nest. Black bears, um, very, very few grizzly bears in Washington. There may be a handful in the North Cascades, but not a appreciable presence at all. Um, but black bears are fairly ubiquitous in any place where there's enough wild character to the to the territory where they can stay out of trouble with people. So they don't really hibernate, but they kind of do. Uh, they vary in color from blonde to to brown, most of the Western Washington, oh, to black, and most of the Western Washington birds, uh, birds, bears, sorry, bear, I called you a bird, are black. And a big one weighs 400 pounds. So I, most people have seen a bear uh, and it was generally leaving when it saw you. And this is an important point. Uh, a fed bear is a dead bear. If you're in a situation where bears are eating your garbage or getting in your bird feeders, you got to put that stuff away because that bear is going to get in trouble and they're going to be forced to, to shoot it or to trap it. They, they usually don't reload. They, sometimes they relocate bears, but not much. Cougars, same type of setting for cougars, meaning they need enough wild land 
uh, to allow them to hunt deer. They mostly eat deer. They're pretty much a predator. They will take small animals and pets. You'll hear anecdotes about, you know, somebody's little dog disappeared. Uh, they're mostly nocturnal. And they've done some studies where they radioed cougars near uh, human habitation, like the one I think of directly is near Cleellum. And they radioed all these cats. And the little town of Cleellum, you probably know where that is, right off of I-90. If you could put dots on a map, they would just hang out right along the edge of town. And part of that may have been because, you know, there were these deer sheltering in town. So cougars are around, rarely seen. Most people have seen them. No, 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 no. Most people have not seen them. A few people have seen them a few times. And they're generally secretive and non-aggressive. I mean, it, the, the cougar attacks we hear about are are almost always some bizarre fluke. And so they're not worth being afraid of, let's just say that. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, sap suckers, I mentioned them earlier. Uh, these are the, uh, there's three types in Washington. These are the two dominant ones. Uh, the red breasted is mostly non-migratory. Birders, correct me if I'm wrong about that. The red naped, more on the east side, these guys leave, they migrate away and we don't know where they go. Um, yeah, and I mentioned the sap wells here. It doesn't kill the tree, but they, they come back and use them year after year. Migratory songbirds, amazing set. About a third of our birds in the forest are migratory and things like the Western tanager. Look at this list. The, <coughs> excuse me again. The flycatchers, the vireos, read that list down there. I mean, you start thinking about it. How many of our beloved birds leave and where do they go? You know, like these little teeny warblers, like that yellow warbler or that Townsend's warbler or a hermit thrush. And <laughs> these beautiful thrush calls. Well, this is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology eBird. Watch the date. And each dot represents a species, just uh, reported sightings of that species month by month. So by June, here's our Northwest cohort, July, they're starting to leave August. They're already migrating away. September, they're all over the border. October, they're back to their winter range. Here they are, November, December. Check, start over, there we go. January, February, March, things start to move. Here we go, March, moving north, April, May, now. They've, some of them arrived a little bit ago. Here they are, June, July. They have their kids. They get the kids out of the nest. They turn around and make their way back. And when they come north, they sort of follow the flush of spring. When they head south, it's still summer into fall. When fall gets here, they're already almost back on their winter range. So there's a lot of our fauna that uses the whole continent as their home range. I just, this is miraculous. Uh, uh, the uh, the mi bird migration is something worth reading about and studying. And once you tease out, you know, a Cooper's hawk or a, a violet green swallow goes all the way to Veracruz, Mexico. And now they're back here in my nest boxes. I'm just, I get astounded at that. A barred owls. Woo, 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 woo. Uh, dark spots on a light background, round head, dark eyes. This is what we have all over Western Washington and in Eastern Washington. Now they're in towns, they're, they're, they live in cities. They're an amazing, well-adapted bird. We, we might as well embrace the bard because here they stay. See the, the picture of this one? Um, yeah, that's a juvenile in a mixed woodland on Vashon Island. Uh, yeah, let's see. I'm over time. Kevin says, hurry up. I'm almost done, Kevin. Can I keep going? Okay, we got the, the famous spotted owl living in deep, mature forest, round head, dark eyes, white spots on a dark background, significant declines, um, an amazing bird, uh, important, tame and mellow, and they used to be famous just a few years back. You wouldn't say spotted owl in a presentation because people would get all riled up. Front cover of Time Magazine, June of 1990. Anyway, they still exist in reduced populations, but in the forest. Flying squirrels live in cavities, eat mushrooms, are in these mature secondary forests. Some of you may have them um, around, but they're more widespread than we know. Almost done. Uh, bats, a lot of people like bats. Bats are a terribly interesting group of animals. We have about 18 species in Washington. Half of them migrate and we don't even know where they go. How do you, how do you tra radio track a bat? How do you put a collar on that thing? Um, some of them hibernate. 
but we don't know where they go either. We know a little bit. And so bats are amazing. They use echolocation to catch bugs on the wing. They eat enormous numbers of insects and they're just a terribly fascinating uh, fauna. They're in trouble, white nose syndrome, habitat loss, keep those snags standing, but bats are cool. Amphibians, you know, antediluvian, uh, ancient groups of species living down in the, in the duff and in the water. So that was just a blow by on some of the cool stuff that's out there. And every single species is a window into nature. And so, you know, it's really fun to identify something and then follow it and see what it did. So we have a remarkable species of diversity in Washington and people kind of, and this is a little bit of a, a punchline, you know, what can you do to help? Well, the first thing is to keep your forest as forest, keep your wildlands as wildlands, whatever version they are, you know, don't pave them if you can, wherever you can. And where you can influence management, like on your own property, uh, do habitat diversity, uh, big trees, little trees, brush, openings, uh, logs, snags, everything. Here's one. People say, what can I do? Well, here's a couple. We'll keep your cats inside because they do make a tremendous impact on birds and small mammals. Uh, put markers on your windows so the birds don't fly into them. Here's one. Outdoor lighting uh, confuses migratory birds, bats, and even some insects. So you, these are things you can do as an individual. And you can utilize strategic habitat enhancements. I have people ask me about nest boxes and piles, and it's kind of, you know, one of my uh, things that I like to talk about is that. And um, along that line, we've doing, we're doing this three more times. So if it seemed like I blew right by uh, dead wood, for example, I'm going to do a whole webinar on dead wood. Just, that's just next week. Holy smokes. Then we're going to do one about uh, animals eating trees, animal damage. And the last one on June 18th, I will speak specifically to uh, nest boxes, uh, habitat piles, plantings, uh, water, you know, how you can enable animals to better survive on your property uh, with limiting factors. Uh, thanks to some of my friends for the photos. Uh, there they are, Terry Piper, Scott, Don, Greg Thompson, Con, William. And thank you to you for coming tonight. That's my email address. You can find me through the DNR and through Kevin. If you have some question or something I might be able to help you find the answer on, just send me an email and I'll answer you and I'll probably send you a link. Um, yeah, and, and there's lots, 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 lots to this, you know, and, I, and I, I love the fact that every one of us indeed is our own uh, little experiment, meaning when you observe something, that's, that's your data point that you can connect to other data points that you might gather by reading something, by taking a webinar, you know, to get a, a deeper appreciation for the wildlife and to help them continue to exist uh, on this beautiful planet. There we go. And that's the presentation. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, if you need to jump off now, of course, feel free to do that. Otherwise, so uh, we can stay and take questions. So I'm going to go back here. Uh, does WSU offer a species checklist? I don't think we do. That's a good idea, though. Brendan, write that down. You know who does is the Burke Museum oh. and Audubon. Audubon has a bird list. Uh, but a lot of Audubon chapters have a bird list by county. Um, so there's one. Uh, oh, here you go. You know what? Somebody's asking about my email address. Let's just go back to that screen. There it is. Yeah, the Burke Museum is great. There you go. Um, yeah, so there, those lists are around, but the Burke Museum has some really interesting, uh, like, coverage of, like, uh, am amphibians and reptiles, for example. Yeah. Okay. And then are humans affecting the migration pattern? You talked about that a little bit with light pollution. Yes, yes, in, in certain areas, big time. Um, well, so a great example uh, is the mitigations being done on Interstate 90, where some of the movement patterns of wildlife was interrupted by the freeway. So they're trying to put crossings to allow the animals to cross. I mean, frankly, it depends on the animal and the scale, but in uh, urbanizing settings, you could have, for example, a busy road 
with a pond on one side and a forest on the other where previously the frogs or the salamanders crawled across there without much traffic. And now there's so much traffic that they get run over. And before you know it, that local population is gone from the impact of that barrier. That's, that's, yeah. So yes, and that's actually a very significant uh, source of some study and attempts at influencing a uh, new infrastructure of whatever kind. Uh, and it's often not uh, well, it's, it's not well received, let's just say. Yep. Okay, here's a good question. Do the birds also reproduce in the Southern Hemisphere during the Summer Hemisphere's spring and summer? This, you mean the birds from the Northern Hemisphere? Or are you asking if the Southern Hemisphere birds do a similar North or South North migration? Which they do. So they're like, there's migrations in like Africa from, uh, and South America too, from mid, you know, or from the equator South to go and, and, and vice versa, where birds from the, for, excuse me, birds from the colder climates would go to warmer climates to breed and vice versa. Yeah, so yes, I think the answer to that is yes. I think the question might have been though, whether or not they reproduced in both places. You know, some species do. Some, I believe some species do. There are birds that will nest. Uh, and, and one hypothesis about migration is that competition for breeding sites has been an evolutionary driver, just pushing certain species a little farther north and a great example is that Western tanager, like here in Washington, we have one species of breeding tanager. And if you went down to Costa Rica, I think there's like 14. And if you go, you go to Arizona and there's like six. So the, yeah, the, the pressure, migration is not a very smart thing to do. If you don't have to migrate, don't do it. It's dangerous. And so the, the very evolution of these migratory species uh, yeah, it has to do with competition on the breeding grounds. I didn't answer the question, but it's a really interesting topic. Okay, uh, we are extremely interested in cultivating bay population. Jason, I don't know what you're referring to. Uh, you're gonna have to type a clarification for us. B uh, B E E or bats? Um, B A Y. I, B-A-Y. Maybe was that supposed to be bat? I think it was probably bat. Okay. Is that Jason Whitlock? Yes. Yeah, he says interesting. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, um, Jason, uh, let's see. So, if you are near a water, like a pond or a bay or even a lake, you think about where you see bats feeding. And a bat populations will concentrate for feeding and then they go roost somewhere during the day and in general the feeding will be based upon the habitat feature say the, the the shallow lake you know that has the insect hatch the roosting will be where they can find a place to get inside of and and in nature it was usually a, a hollow dead tree or loose bark or something like that and we hear many many stories of people who say like well, I've got bats in my barn or under the loose shingles of the old shed you know and so what you can do to encourage bat populations is uh, provide roost sites um, and they could be in the form of boxes they could be in the form of an old shed uh, something like that. And um, if you don't have open water, it's hard to, it's hard to provide open water big enough or a, a, a wet meadow. And so, yeah, that, 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 so a bat's Northwest uh, is a really good source for bat information. I'm going to, uh, Brandon, can you find that website for bats Northwest and pop that up there? Sure. Yeah. So yeah, so um, Jason, the way to encourage bats is to provide uh, roost sites. And there's a, there's a pretty rich literature about how to do that. Good for you for being interested in bats. Bats are way cool. Okay, so here's a question. I have recently cleared some blackberries. Good job, Joyce. <laughs> and was wondering what type of woodland grasses to plant. <clears throat> oh boy, I would... I would uh, forward that question to your local conservation district because the, uh, the variability um, uh, of local uh, species, you know, that do well 
is pretty tremendous. I mean, you, you can you can go with some kind of pasture grasses and such, but I refer you to the local conservation district because they will have expertise on local species. And we always try to encourage people to use as much uh, native species as they can, partly uh, because the pollinators and the rest of the ecosystem knows what to do with them. So, yeah. Cleared blackberries. Wow, good job. Hopefully it worked. And when, when they come back, get them. Okay. Here's a, uh, Simon asked, uh, I help look after a few acres in Lakewood. We sometimes see hawks visit from the neighboring forest land. Our property is mainly stables and horse pastures mm -hmm. with some rough grass areas. What could we do to attract the hawks? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking perch pull. Exactly. Perches. Yes. And I'll bet you 10 bucks that uh, most of those hawks are red tails. Are they, are they big, kind of bigger? And they're perch hunters. So they will, they will sit and look at the grassland and wait for a vole to show itself and then put a boom on it. And so you want them to have a adequate attack angle to cover the whole area. And I say attack angle, because you think about, let's say like a hawk sitting on a, on a utility pole, which by the way, generally is a pretty good perch. And they will fly out at something like a, a 30 degree angle or less in order to have the momentum to make the kill. And so you could almost do a little bit of basic trigonometry uh, and figure out, you know, how would you overlap the, uh, the ability of the hawk to ambush the small rodent in the pasture by way. So you may not need to provide perches. Oh, and, and the, uh, these hawks, the red tails, or even the Cooper's hawk or the sharp shin, will nest in the tops of larger trees. And I bet most of us have seen a red tail nest somewhere. So maintain some big trees, uh, you know, wherever you can and perch poles, yes. I would agree with you, Kevin, excellent. Okay. Uh, any idea about the color variations appearing in black-tailed deer on Whidbey Island? You know, I've heard discussion of uh, on Whidbey that there is occurrence of some kind of piebald deer that have white in them, and there there's some really light-colored portions. Uh, and you know, it, it has to be like a local variation because I've not heard that same comment from like a Bayanacortes or on. Um, the uh, San Juans or, or down in Lewis County. Nobody said like, you know, how come I got light colored deer? So I think it's a local variation. Brendan, have you seen white deer there or light colored deer? You know, I have seen some weird ones. I don't think I've seen any of these crazy colored ones people have been talking about. Interesting. I know my mother in Langley has a family of deer that comes and uh, lives and gives birth in her backyard every year, but they're normal looking deer. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I think it's a local, I don't think it's disease. I've never heard of like uh, hair loss or some, you know, uh, horrible, uh, you know, rotting disease in deer on Whidbey Island. So I'm, I, I, may, I may be wrong. I ought to do a little research on this, but I'm, I'm chalking it up to local, like a local funky color variation with a little bit of albinism popping in there that may be a product of just the overall funky nature of uh, Whidbey Island. Huh, Brendan? Ken, I just linked a photo from some of the Whidbey deer. Did you? Oh, nice. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, wildlife rehabbers are under more restrictive conditions about accepting, rehabbing, and releasing bats due to disease concerns. Do any of these restrictions apply to trying to attract wildlife to our properties, or is that just limited to rehabbers and vets? Yeah, I've never heard of a restriction about habitat uh, enhancements. Um, in general, the restrictions are like WDFW, it's illegal to take a wild animal and make it a pet for example. Um, and bats, uh, they worry about rabies because apparently there's a fair proportion of bats. Not It's not even high. It's like in the one to five percent group that carry rabies, but it doesn't affect them. So um, yeah, no, I don't think it applies to habitat. Okay. Has the population of crows in central Puget Sound increased in the last 50 years? Probably. Uh, Sue, have you ever read um, 
In the Mind of Crows and Ravens by John Marsloff. Uh, if you haven't, get Marsloff's book about crows and ravens. And yes, and cr crows are closely tied to, uh, you know, human habitation. It's really interesting because part of uh, John Marsloff, he's a UW professor, part of his hypothesizing is that crows and humans are sort of co-evolved, that we don't really acknowledge it, but crows need us more than we need crows, but we've had them around for a long time. Whereas ravens are more remote country and they take advantage of us, but they don't need us. And so probably, yes, probably crow populations. And uh, that would be an interesting question for your local uh, wildlife biologist. Uh, Sue, do you know um, Ruth Milner? Uh, she's up in um, oh, Mill Creek and she would be fun to ask that question of. Okay, Simon, yeah, red tail hawk, there you go. Yep. Okay, okay. Uh, here's a good one. Are there any hawks or other predators that will catch Norway rats? And, and you know, this, this got me thinking, Ken. Hmm. Yeah. We do, you know, people rent goats to eat blackberries. <laughs> yeah. uh, why not, you know, rent an owl or rent a hawk? Rent a hawk. Uh, you know, I would expect that owls do take a few rats but they're, you know, rats are mostly nocturnal and they are similar to crows in that they are very much linked to human habitation. And um, yeah, I'm sure they take a few, but obviously they don't knock them back very hard. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Oh, we have a request for the woodpecker song. I think that's gonna have to wait until next week. Yeah, I was gonna when play When we talk about week dead wood so uh that's uh that's a right. little teaser to come back next week i think so who asked for that oh scott ranny yeah baby hi scott oh yeah we'll do it we'll do it next time go put the cd on and you can listen to it <laughs> i have a question for you ken okay you showed the, when you showed the graph maybe you can go back to it of the uh number of people hunting and percentage of the population yeah. hunting yeah. Do you had there's a big dip in both lines in the late 1970s do you have any idea what that's from? Oh, geez. Okay, you're going to make me do this, aren't you? Okay, sorry, everybody. Hang on to your hats. I always get dizzy when somebody does this. There he is. Okay, here he is. Let's see. In the late 1960s, right here? Late and 70s. It, and then it climbed again. I wonder, well, this is... Well, no, uh, sorry, late, late 70s there. That dip. Right there. Yeah. No, I don't know. I did, I did. I just found the graph. I didn't do the look at the hand. They match. Mm -hmm. What What happened in the seventies? Was that Earth Day and the hippie movement? <laughs> That's right. When I started hunting. That's me right there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but but the the main thing with this graph is that it shows this consistent trend across the states. And I want to add that an awful lot of the uh, fish and wildlife agencies across the whole country have been dependent on license revenues for so long. And this means their budgets have just taken a hit big time at the same time that they're being asked to do things like, you know, watchable wildlife programs. That's actually a great example. The state of Washington had watchable wildlife for several years and then they cut it because their budgets were so restricted and they had too many other demands on game wardens and, you know, all the other fundamental things. And so, yeah, I think this is really interesting. The, the good news is if you like to hunt, uh, public lands are less crowded than they used to be. Yeah, so. Sue, Sue chimed in with the gas shortage and the years line up, so. You know, that's, what, that's the first thing that came to my mind yeah. as well. You know, people can't afford to drive gas guzzling pickups uh, out oh. into the hills. That's a good one, okay. Or maybe that's, is that a year where they re-release Bambi in the theaters? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, no, Bambi was already out. Bambi was like in the late fifties. But they Christy, do, uh, you know, re-releases. Christy yeah. Stebbins, are you serious that you actually rented a long-tailed weasel, or you just found, had one on your property that moved in? Wait, is it a long-tailed weasel or a, or a uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, we, uh, 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 what are those? Okay, ones? one that moved one in. No. What's the, what are they called? Um, 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 ah, the, the pet ones, the pet weasels. Like the ferrets? A ferret. I bet you, I bet you rented a ferret. 
Because you well, could it, catch it. I think she she clarified that one had just moved in on her property, and rent, oh, rent, I got you. rent, oh. rent a long tailed weasel was her business plan. Thank you. I, for I like it. I like that. I like one. that too. Yeah, my neighbor had one living under his deck, and he had no mice, and we didn't have one, and we had lots of mice. Hmm. Oh, that's Christy. Yeah, Christy. Yeah, good call. Yeah, yeah. Earth Day started in 1970. That, I think the gas shortage is probably a better call on the reduction in the number of hunters. I think so, too. Or it could just but, be a data error. You know, and, and they attribute the uh, changes in uh, hunting partly to just demographics of more people moving into uh, suburban settings and um, organized sports was the big one because, you know, you think back in time and pretty soon there was soccer and lacrosse and softball and basketball and da, 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 da. And so these kids who would have been going out hunting with dad and grandpa, now they're playing football and dad's going to the game. And so, you know, and then we get video games after that. So I don't know. Mountain beavers. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Mountain beavers. What do you got to say about that? Mountain beavers are one of the most interesting, weirdest animals in our state. They live, for those who don't know, they're a rodent in a totally unique genus. They're about the size of a loaf of bread and they look like a guinea pig. Their eyes are really little. They have these amazingly wide whiskers and they're fossorial, meaning they dig burrow systems. And their burrows are about, and for those who've seen them, their burrows are probably, what Kevin, five, six inches in diameter? And they're really obvious. It's like, what's that big hole right there? And they, they come out and they mostly at night and they snip off vegetation and take it underground to these chambers in their burrows and they dry it and they, they live under, they have like this apartment complex. They have a chamber for pooping, a chamber for storage and they're solitary. So their burrow systems do not overlap. So if you see a, a hillside that's got a series of them, those mountain beavers are like neighbors. And um, they eat a lot of succulent vegetation. They can be really hard on a new tree plantation, but once the trees get a little bit of size to them, they pretty much leave them alone. Um, and they're just a really interesting animal. Apolodontia rufa. I don't know. Yeah. So you they're, they're, and they're, oh, and they're not everywhere. They, they will be localized. Some people have them and some people don't. I can't remember like the rannies over by Shelton. I think, I can't remember, Scott, if you had them, uh, but some people have a lot of them and some have none. And it might be soil type, that I don't know. Pretty interesting. So see, you can see people live with wildlife. They, and, and I, I encourage everybody to pick like two of your favorite species that you just are, are interested, mountain beavers that you're interested in, uh, long-tailed weasels, and just Google them. And then follow those links three or four times. And before you know it, you are the rest of your life an expert on mountain beavers, western tanagers, pileated woodpeckers, whatever. And you'll be surprised how many of those species will link you back to a dead tree, which I'm going to have a lot of fun talking about on Wednesday. So uh, here's my email. Feel free to... Uh, Hit me there. Oh, we got another. We have one. a couple more. Uh, yeah, so, okay. what are the mirrorlet. key? Yeah, marbled mirrorlets. Uh, key habitat indicators. Could they uh, live in the South Puget Trough? So, marbled mirrorlets. For those who, yeah, most of us have heard of them, are a little seabird that spend most of their time out on the salt water. So, like when you go across on the ferry to the San Juans and you see the mirrors you know, floating around by the gulls. So you'll see the black and white seabird. And every now and then there'll be this little teeny one, like the size of a robin, a little teeny speckly seabird. That's a murrelet. And there's like two or three different kinds, but the marbles are out there. And they have this amazing breeding uh, habit of flying into old forest and dropping in from the canopy to a branch, a, a mossy branch that's big enough to act as if it was a sea cliff. Now think about competition among seabirds for nesting sites on those cliffs, like on those sea stacks off the coast where there'll be those swarms of, of gulls and, and the mirrors and all these things there. So the marble mirrorlet eons ago adapted itself 
or I don't know how that works, is adapted to using those ancient forests of the coast as their cliffs. And so they fly in like up these river bottoms and then drop into the big trees. And so the, the key habitat indicator are trees with branches big enough to be used as nest sites because they're only going into the forest for nesting, food, water, cover. And so for a murrelet, it's this really amazing life history tied to the whole landscape where they, you know, feed on pelagic fish in the inshore, sometimes go offshore and then fly into the forest to breed and then fly back out to the ocean to get food to fly in and feed their young. And so uh, there's been, and they're really hard to survey for because they fly like at night. And so the people, if you've ever met anybody who did marble murrelet surveys, you have to go sit in the forest in the dark and wait to hear. And that was it. <laughs> it's like what and they waited they didn't even find a marble murrelet nest until late last century i want to say it was in the 80s it was some, and it was a guy climbing a tree uh in a redwood and he scared one off of a nest and he looked down and it was like i'll be damned and they knew they nested in the forest but we had never found where they nested until late last century there's a really cool book about marble murrelets that obviously i read so could the puget trough troll hold, uh, hold them probably used to, probably in pretty fair numbers. My own opinion is it's, it would be too far and too hard for them to refine, uh, meaning relocate stands that had grown to the condition to be available for nesting. But closer to coastlines on the Olympic Peninsula, they're still out there. Vancouver Island, they're still out there. Yeah, so yeah. Mountain beavers again. Uh, May I, Kevin, or you go? No, please. Uh, the, que the next question was, do mountain beavers have to be near water? Um, usually they are near water because they apparently, one uh, natural history tidbit is their kidneys don't work very good. And uh, they have to have free water to be able to digest their food. But they don't swim. They're not beavers. It's really unfortunate they're called mountain beavers because they're not beavers at all. Uh, Let's see, you have something burrowing in a pasture. The burrow opening is, yeah, it could be a mountain beaver in a pasture, interesting. How about a marmot? Do you have marmots, uh, GRE? So that's a question. Okay, here's Mazama. Hey, Diane, I should come up and visit you. Uh, find a carton chewed into one and empty of eggs. Sorry, I, Kevin, you, you read it there, there we go. Okay. Um... Friends left us a carton of eggs on our deck, 18 eggs. We came home to find a carton chewed into on one end and empty of eggs. No trace wow. left, not even egg shells. What do you think took our eggs? How big was the hole? Was it like weasel size? I'm imagining, because if it was a skunk or a raccoon, they would have eaten a bigger hole or even ripped it open and taken them. Some kind of a little mammal, it wasn't a bird. Uh, so weasel, <laughs> interesting, nice. You live in Mazama. I'm only uh, 10 miles from you. Then Scott had mountain beavers over there by Sheldon. Uh, Diane, to answer your question, I don't know, but it was a, a mammal of some kind, and I'm guessing a long-tailed weasel. Let's see, an app to identify the sounds of birds, Sibley. Uh, Sibley's um, uh, birding software. S-I-B-L-E-Y. And it's this, my, my, uh, goes on your smartphone and you can, it, it does amazing sorting things. There are several different apps though. So yeah. iBird Pro. There you go. Ray's got one for you. And Anita, I think is suggesting the uh, Norway rat. I don't believe we have Norway rats in Mazama. Interesting rat uh, tidbit is and so I get so I get to travel all around the state in this wonderful job, meeting meeting wonderful people like you, and um, I will get these little triangulations on presence absence of certain species, and rats are not everywhere, but they are in certain areas closer to the coast, which I find interesting. Like some people will um, report, you know, and and often they will know they have rats because they have chickens. 
and the rats will get in the chicken coop or the cat will kill one or something. So, and I say rats, meaning Norway rats, meaning the bear tailed, you know, the, the urban rat. And there's another one called a, a ship rat, which is black and a little bit smaller. And then there's the bushy tailed wood rat which tend to be in rural settings like up in Northeast Washington or here that are, uh, they look kind of like a squirrel, but they have a long bushy tail, bushy tailed wood rat. And they're a native, pretty remarkable species. Okay, here you go. Jason Whitlock says Merlin. Yep. So there you go. There's another one right there. I have never tried Merlin, but you like having that one, Jason. That's a good I, one. I use Merlin and it's fantastic. Oh, it is. How much does it cost? It's free. Is it really? Yeah. Is it from Cornell? It is. Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Send them a donation. What, what's it called again? Merlin. Merlin, okay. bird ID. See, that's another reason I love this job. I'm always picking things up. Fun. So let's see. So I don't know if anybody has uh, other questions, like particularly some people were asking earlier about um, – you know, what kind of a box should I build for bats? So we had a little bit of enhancement uh, questions. Tune in on uh, June, whatever date that was. Let's see, let's go back here. There you go, June 18, because I was going to offer some links and some thoughts on like, for example, how to build a box or, you know, create a snag. Like if you want some snags, how do you kill a tree? Um, so that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, that, that'll be fun. And and I, I am obsessed with dead trees. And yes, Scott, we'll, uh, I'll see if I can play the woodpecker song um, next week. Um, and uh, I don't know, Kevin, what else? What does a black bear sleeping area look like? It, sometimes they will, black bears will sleep on the surface and it'll be a, a smoothed out area right at the base of a tree. A den will be a dugout place either under some rocks or often under a log or even a slash pile. Um, and the hole will be surprisingly small because they don't, they don't really don't want it to be any more obvious than it has to be, but it'll look like a hole under a log and you'll be like, huh, and don't, you know, crawl in there if it's uh, June. So there you go. Oh, you looked up a marmot and found a video tarmot marmot tb licks gopro oh funny you know and gopros trail cameras have revolutionized wildlife observation it's so fun there's so many things that people are getting actual visuals of that they can share that and this didn't happen even five years ago so um, I sure appreciate it thank you scott and yeah send me your send me your good stuff i have uh the opportunity to do articles for WSU for stewardship notes and the small forest landowner office. And I did one a while back called uh, trail cameras, greatest hits. <laughs> I want to do that with videos, Kevin, maybe we could figure out how to have links to the, you know, the possum with the GoPro on his head <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. We, we can take audience suggestions. Okay. Yes. All so, right. Well, I think that wraps us up. And yeah. We thanks Ken for another great presentation. Yep. Looking forward to the next three. And to all you folks, we wish you a very pleasant good evening. Yay. Yeah, thanks for coming. Good night. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>